أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء وسيد المرسلين وحبيب إله العالمين أبي القاسم محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المكرمين الغرر الميامين سيما بقية الله في الأرضين وحجته على الخلائق أجمعين سيدنا وإمام زماننا وصاحب نعمتنا وولي أمرنا مهدي هذه الأمة وطاووس أهل الجنة الحجة ابن الحسن العسكري Fidahu Arwahul Alameen. My dear, respected elders, brothers, and sisters, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. All of the Imams, the entire family of the Holy Prophet, were without a doubt oppressed. However, even more oppressed is Imam al Hassan alayhi salam. The reason I say that is because he is oppressed even among the followers of the Ahl Bayt. I'm sure that you can all agree that when it comes to Imam al Hassan, if I asked the average Shia how much they know about him, they probably couldn't say much. An average follower, an avowed partisan of Imam al Hassan, couldn't speak for 15 minutes about the virtues and the merits of the holy Imam. And that means that he's not only oppressed by others outside the fold of Tashayya, but also within this community. Think of the fact that Amir al-Mu'mineen was subjected to what some might describe as historical revisionism. Historical revisionism or denialism is when historians try to downplay the significance of an individual or an event. It is when they obscure certain facts, completely omitting, or perhaps taking some events and not talking about others, so that this individual is not given his or her due right and significance. This is a crime that was perpetrated against Amir al-Mu'mineen in the most blatant and stark manner. I'll give you just a couple of examples. Amir al-Mu'mineen was the undisputed hero in the Battle of Badr. He was the one who single-handedly killed 70 enemy combatants all by himself, while the rest of the Muslim army killed another 70 with the help of Ali ibn Abi Talib. He was such an overarching personality and presence in the Battle of Badr. And yet, it got to the point where people were saying, did Ali even participate in Badr? That's one example. The other example is the fact that the worship of Ali ibn Abi Talib was like no other, it had no equal. And yet, when he was killed, people in Sham were saying, how could Ali die in the state of prayer? Did he even pray? The third example is that the recitation of the Quran of Amir al Mu'mineen has now become the standard across the Muslim world. Muslims recite the Quran in accordance with the version that was brought and presented by Amir al Mu'mineen. And yet, there were people saying, Ali died and never read the Quran. 
Now you can imagine, at the time of the death of the Holy Prophet, Amir al-Mu'mineen was 30 years old. A 30-year-old man whose presence was so obvious and so clear across the history of Islam, the first believer, the one who was with the Prophet all along. There were still people denying his virtues or claiming ignorance about his attributes. So when it comes to someone who was only seven years old at the time of the death of the Holy Prophet, is it then inconceivable to understand why it would be so much easier to obscure his virtues? If they did it to Amir al-Mu'mineen, obviously they're going to do it to Imam al-Hassan alayhi salam. Which is why, and I want you to focus on this point, Imam al-Hassan spent his entire imam, which spanned for 10 years, trying to restore the virtues of Amir al mumineen trying to remind everyone of the attributes, the undisputed and unequal attributes of Ali ibn Abi Talib. That entire time, Imam al-Hassan's efforts were focused on this point. The reason I say that is because throughout the year, my dear brothers and sisters, and I want you to pay close attention, we have significant events that must be glorified. They must be amplified. Events such as Ghadir need proper preparation. Ghadir is a few months away. But it's not something that we should wait until a night or two before Ghadir. And I know there are many people in the community, may Allah bless them, who put in great effort in trying to hold a celebration that is perhaps something that would make us proud, that we've done something in service to Amir al mumineen right? But that's not enough. We should prepare for Ghadir from now. The reason I say that is because Rasulullah, on the day of Ghadir, what did he say? He told everyone who had gathered, فَلْيُبَلِّغِ الْحَاضِرُ الْغَائِبِ Those who are present, should convey this message to those who are absent. We who know about the appointment of Amir al-Mu'mineen have a moral and religious duty to convey this message far and wide. You as a Shia of Ali ibn Abi Talib, when Rasulullah says that you must convey this to those who are absent, it means now that you hold his love in your heart, you must convey this to those who don't. So many Muslims around the world don't know anything about Ali ibn Abi Talib. Because on the pulpits, all they hear about is such and such. Ali ibn Abi Talib is a footnote to them. He is negligible. He's not someone that deserves their attention. And when they lack knowledge about Amir al-Mu'mineen, the end result is what we see around the world today. We all have a duty to convey this message, which is why Rasulullah then adds two critical points. One of which is glad tidy, one of which is something that we should aim to achieve. The other is a stark warning. What does the Prophet say? He said, Allahumma ansur man nasara. Oh Allah, whoever supports Ali ibn Abi Talib, I want you to support them. And whoever abandons Amir al Mu'mineen, you should abandon them. And so, this is a warning that's worthy of our attention, brothers and sisters. If we fail Ali ibn Abi Talib, if we abandon him, if we don't support him, if we don't convey his message to other people, where does that put us? In which category? And so, Imam al-Hassan spent his entire life in his service to Amir al-Mu'mini. Every time he ascended the pulpit, 
He praised Ali ibn Abi Talib and he cited his virtues. Every time Muawiyah, may Allah curse him for all eternity, tried to curse Ali ibn Abi Talib. It's right there in Sahih Muslim. This isn't something they can whitewash. They can't hide the fact that Muawiyah cursed Ali ibn Abi Talib atop the pulpits. Imam al Hassan was there to defend Amir al Mu'mineen and to scold Muawiyah and his cronies. Imam al Hassan, according to one hadith of Imam al Rida, والسلام, the Imam speaks about the virtues of the Shia. We call ourselves what? Shia. We are followers and lovers of Amir al Mu'mineen. Imam al Rida provides a list of descriptions for the Shia of Ali ibn Abi Talib, then the Imam says, you think you're a Shia? إِنَّمَا شِيَعَتُهُ الْحَسَنُ وَالْحُسَيْنُ وَسَلْمَانُ وَأَبُوْ ذَرْ I swear to God, it's statements like these that remind me of just how much I failed Amir al-Mu'mineen. How much we have neglected the Imam and our duty towards him. One of the Shia of Ali ibn Abi Talib is Imam al Hassan. If that's the standard, where does that put you and I? If Imam al Hussein is a Shia of Ali, where does that put you and I? And so, what I like to do tonight in the short time that I have, and I want your full attention, inshallah, because this is important, is to talk about the fact that our celebration on this auspicious night is more than just a jubilant festivity. We all celebrate it, as we must. We're all happy. Everyone is in a festive mood. But not just because the Prophet had a grandson. Not because Amir al muminin and Fatima al-Zahra, Sayyidat al-Nisa, had a son on a night like this. It's much, much more than that. And I'll explain how. And to understand why this event is so phenomenal and significant, I need to condense the timeline to paint a picture for you. And it has to do with the final stretch of the primordial battle between good and evil. As I said, it's more than just the birth of an infallible Imam. An ocean of knowledge and virtue and goodness that he is. But it's more than that. How? The Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi wa Wasallam is born. Allahumma sallam. This marks the beginning of the final chapter in the fight between good and evil. Satan howls and screams, but does he give up now that the Prophet is born? Absolutely not. Instead, once he calms from his uh, paranoia, from his anger, that the messenger of God, the final prophet, has been born, he then, he sobers up from that, and he mobilizes his demons. He brings his army and marches them into battle. And because the holy prophet was the best of the best of God's creations, his enemies thus became the worst of the worst. Because as I said, shaitan, intensified his efforts and multiplied his work so as to get people and demons who are up to the task. The first thing they did, the enemies of the Holy Prophet, was accuse him of insanity. They accused him of being a liar. They accused him of being a magician. Now, all of those labels as hurtful as tragic, as painful as they were, they couldn't stick. Because when you see the Holy Prophet, you recognize who he really is. 
He is absolutely not insane. He is most definitely not a magician. They used to practice magic back then. They knew what magic looked like. It wasn't that. And finally, the accusation of being a liar most certainly couldn't taint the reputation of Rasulullah because everyone knew that he was a sadiqul ameen. He was the most truthful person that they had ever encountered. And he was reliable. He was trustworthy. So those accusations didn't do the job. Then they moved to plan B. And plan B was to try and kill the Holy Messenger. So they waged war after war against him. That didn't work. Then they said, let's assassinate him if we confront the Muslim army. There's going to be Ali ibn Abi Talib is one of the soldiers of the Holy Prophet. And there's no point in facing off with Ali. So instead, let's try and assassinate him. We'll attack him in his bed while sleeping. We all know how that plan worked out. It was Ali ibn Abi Talib who once again went and protected the Holy Messenger of God. Then they said, let's kill him in the Aqaba, which was the assassination attempt where the Holy Prophet is going through a valley with only two of his companions. And they said that we will wear masks, we'll go all the way up to the summit of the mountain and we will roll some stones scare off the mules, scare off the horses, so the mules end up throwing the Holy Prophet down the valley and he would die. That of course did not work either because Rasulullah was forewarned by Jibra'il about their plot, about their scheme, and so they couldn't kill the messenger. They were all exposed. Hudayfa ibn al-Yaman was told their names and the plot was foiled. So. Wars, before them accusations, after the wars there were assassination attempts. Then they were watching the Holy Messenger of God very closely and they started to chat and speak amongst themselves that look, let's just wait this out. Let's see what happens to this person, meaning the Holy Messenger. Ultimately, he's going to die. Either we assassinate him, we poison him, we'll, we'll keep trying. But ultimately, we have reason to celebrate because he has no children. And so when he dies, we will then take over and we will restore the idols on top of the Kaaba and bring back our way of life, which was nothing but vice and idolatry. So let's wait this out and see what happens. The Holy Prophet had a son. This boy known as Ibrahim, he was the son of the Holy Messenger and his mother was Maria Al-Qibtiya. Maria, the first thing they did when she got pregnant was that they spread rumors that Maria had committed adultery. وَالْعَيَاذُ billah. Now, sometimes all it takes is a rumor. All people need is an if. And once the rumor spreads, once somebody says something, you never know how far that's going to go. And so how do you deny a rumor like this? How do you dispel this accusation? There is no way you could do that. Nowadays you have DNA tests and things like that. Even they're not 100% reliable or definitive. But back then, how do you do this? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed verses in which he exonerated Mari al qibtiya and condemned the ones that had fabricated and concocted these lies against her. Ayatul Ifq, the other school said that this was about Aisha. It most certainly was not. Aisha's name is nowhere to be found in those verses. It was about, about Mari al qibtiya and the story contains a lot of details, but we'll leave that for another time. Ultimately, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala came and defended Maria and her chastity and loyalty to the Prophet and exonerated her of the accusation that was made against her. So now they've pretty much exhausted all of their 
effort. They've tried everything. Accused the Prophet, tried to kill him. Then he doesn't have any children. Now he has a boy. Let's accuse the mother. You see how the plan unfolded? How they persisted? How they were so adamant on destroying the Holy Prophet and his legacy? So Ibrahim is born. They're getting anxious. They're getting worried. What's going to happen if the Prophet dies and his son becomes his successor? What are we going to do? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chooses for Ibrahim to die. Why Ibrahim died is another discussion for another time. But ultimately, Allah in his infinite wisdom chose to take Ibrahim. When Ibrahim died, they were ecstatic. The Prophet has no male offspring. He has no children. Al-As ibn Wa'il is a person that you are probably familiar with. He was the father of Amr ibn al-As. Amr ibn al-As was the top advisor and partner and one of the cronies of Muawiyah. Al-As ibn Wa'il, when Ibrahim died, he went and started telling people, Inna Muhammadan abta. Muhammad has no descendants. He has no children, no progeny, no male heir. So now all we have to do is wait until he dies and we can take over. One day, I'll mention this parenthetically, Muawiyah and his posse were sitting down drinking alcohol and because they were probably drunk beyond the ability to think rationally, one of them said, let's summon Al-Hasan ibn Ali so we can have a little fun with him, so we can mock him. Muawiyah, who was probably a little bit more sober than the rest, he said, listen, you're playing with fire. You can't challenge these people. كَبِيرُهُمْ لَا يُقَاسِ وَصَغِيرُهُمْ جَمْرَةٌ لَا تُدَاسِ As they said to Yazid, or I think it was Yazid himself who said this, when Imam Zayl Abidin wanted to ascend the pulpit and deliver his sermon in the court of Yazid. He said, listen, you're telling me to let this young man give the sermon, but what you don't know is that this is a family where the adults are incomparable to others. And the children are like small fiery embers that you can't step over. Muawiyah said, don't play with fire. They said, no, what's he going to do? There's only one of him and so many of us. Bring him, let's have some fun. So they bring Imam al-Hasan salam. They began to mock the Imam. The Imam addressed them one after the other, completely disrobing and exposing these individuals one by one until he reached Amr ibn al-As. The Imam said just one thing. He said to him, what are you going to do with the fact that Allah revealed a verse in the Quran showing that you are a bastard? Where in the Quran? When Al-As ibn Wa'il said that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi has no progeny, he has no children, no descendants. Allah revealed the verses in the Holy Quran in Surah Al-Kawthar. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Inna a'atainaka al-Kawthar. Fasalli li rabbika wanhar. Inna shani'aka huwa al-Abtar. We have given you the Kawthar, the endless goodness, and that your enemy, your accuser, the one who's mocking you, he's the one with no lineage. In other words, Amr ibn al-As couldn't have children. He was infertile. And so, what does that make you, O Amr? The one you claim is your father isn't your father. And we all know that. Abu Sufyan had something to do with it. There was a bit of a situation where a bunch of men ambushed your mother. And so, they all looked at each other, their jaws dropped. They're like, Muawiyah said, I told you. This is what you wanted. My point is that 
they kept trying, they kept trying, they kept trying. Ibrahim dies, Fatima alayhi salam is there, but Fatima is not a male heir to the Prophet. So they felt like they still had a chance. There's still things we can do about this until the birth of Imam al Hassan. When Imam al Hassan was born, that brought to an abrupt end all of their dreams. Why? Because when the Imam was born, he wasn't just a grandson to Rasulullah. Rather, he was the Prophet's own son. The Messenger of Allah would always address Imam al Hassan and Imam al Hussein as Waladai, Ibnai. The Imams, Imam al Hassan and Imam al Hussein themselves would always introduce themselves as Imam al Hassan would say, Man arafani faqad arafani, whoever knows me knows me, wa man lam yarifni, fa innani al Hassan ibn Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. I am the son of the messenger. You know that after the self-proclaimed Khilafah was established, this was a military coup d'etat in every sense of the word, such that they could not tolerate any criticism of any kind. If, let's say, there was an insurrection there were a group of people within the Muslim Ummah who decided to wage war against the Khalifa, take up arms, carry swords and spears and ride on horseback and march towards Medina. We would say that there was civil war. That's what you'd call it, right? And in such a case, in a civil war, you confront an army with an army, right? Military force with a military force. But they did not tolerate not just a military force, but even criticism. Any dissent was crushed immediately. Fatima to Zahra alayhi salam never mobilized an army. She never gave out swords to anyone. All she did was speak. All she did was deliver a sermon and say that this is an illegitimate government. They did not tolerate this to the extent that we believe unequivocally that they ended up killing Fatima to Zahra and her unborn fetus. But the Sunni school, while they've tried to omit this part of the narrative that Fatima was in fact was killed, they do go as far as to say that she was threatened with having her house burned to the ground. That they acknowledge. They agree with that. Even Ibn Taymiyyah al-Harrani. Ibn Taymiyyah whose entire life was dedicated to denying the oppression of the Ahlul Bayt as well as their virtues and merits, even he acknowledges that the house of Fatima to Zahra was ambushed. So I'm trying to paint a picture where you understand how uh, little tolerance they had or no toler tolerance they had towards any dissenting views, towards any criticism. Umm Salama, Salamullahi ala Umm Salama, the wife of the Holy Prophet. All she did was testify in court that this land belongs to Fatima alayhi salam. That I heard the Prophet say that this is my gift to you. That's all she did. For an entire year, Umm Salama was starved. She was bankrupted. They used economic embargo against Umm Salama. They did not pay her a penny, even though every Muslim was entitled to money from the Muslim treasury. Umm Salama got nothing because of this one stance. So, zero tolerance for dissent or any opposition. Now, it was in the first few months after the first caliph had assumed power, Imam al Hassan was about seven years old. He comes into the masjid. He points to the self-proclaimed Khalifa. He said to him, Inzil an minbari abi. Get off the pulpit of my father. The Khalifa stuttered a bit. Didn't exactly know how to respond to that. He was silent for a few moments. Then he simply got off the minbar. Look at the grandeur, the presence of Imam al-Hassan, a seven-year-old boy. 
It's not just a seven-year-old boy, is it? This is the son of Rasulullah. He got off the pulpit. Then he went straight to Amir al-Mu'mineen. He said to him, Ya Abu al-Hasan, this is what you do? You speak to your children? You get them to revolt against the Khilafah? You send your kids to talk to me? Amir al-Mu'mineen responded with just one thing, going back to the point that I mentioned. He said, what are you talking about? هذا الحسن ابن رسول الله This is Hassan, the son of the Holy Prophet. In other words, this is shameful. It's an insult that I spoke to him and I fed him all of these things. He's the one who speaks on behalf of the Messenger of God. He's his son. He's the heir of Rasulullah. Such that if you deny the virtues of Amir al-Mu'mineen, if you try to whitewash or diminish or obscure or, or obfuscate the merits of Ali ibn Abi Talib, you can't do that to Imam al Hassan. It's his son, the son of the Holy Prophet. What are you going to do? Allahu Akbar. I'll mention just one of the virtues of Imam al Hassan and end this session, inshaAllah. The Holy Prophet was not in the habit of challenging other people so that they would turn to faith. It was always the other way around. People would come to the Prophet and they would say, we want to see a miracle. Split the moon, summon that tree, do this, do that. It was others who challenged Rasulullah and Rasulullah responded accordingly. On one occasion, Allah instructs the Messenger of God to challenge the other side. Which occasion was this? It was when a group of Christians, it wasn't regular Christian followers, but rather it was their monks, their, uh, if you like, bishops, their top leaders who came to the Holy Prophet. They said to him, present your religion to us. The Prophet presented his faith, his religion, the tenets of Islam. And once they realized that the Prophet is telling the truth, they rejected him anyway. In other words, it wasn't just a lack of faith or lack of knowledge, it was an outright rejection once the faith was established. This is when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commanded the Holy Prophet. He said, فَإِنْ حَاجُوكَ فِيهِ This is in Surah Al-Imran, verse number 61, I believe. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told the Prophet, now that you've established the faith, we have revealed the knowledge. If they continue to reject it, then call for a duel, a challenge. What was it? فَقُلْ تَعَالَوْ نَدْعُ أَبْنَاءَنَا وَأَبْنَاءَكُمْ وَنِسَاءَنَا وَنِسَاءَكُمْ وَأَنفُسَنَا وَأَنفُسَكُمْ ثُمَّ نَبْتَهِلْ Tell them, let's gather the best of the best, the cream of the crop. Who? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala spells it specifically. He said, tell them, let us invite and bring along who? Our children, abna'ana, and your children. Wanisa'ana, our women and your women. And ourselves and yourselves. What is this verse talking about? The showdown is about to take place. It's a challenge made by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala against the bishops of the Christians of Najran, which is a province in the south of the Arabian Peninsula, that we should come together and pray to God. You say that you're truthful. You've rejected our proposal. So let us pray to God and invoke his wrath upon the liar. This is what mubahala means. And by the way, I could go on and talk about mubahala for five, six, seven nights, but I'm just trying to condense the timeline. Because the nuances in the story of mubahala, the verse of mubahala, the incidents that took place, all of the details are incredibly important, absolutely critical. So Allah says to the Prophet, let us bring the best of the best, and by best of the best, 
we're talking about those who were closest to the Prophet and those closest to the bishops. There's two kinds of closeness. One is blood relation, where those who are closest to you would be brought along as per the prescription of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And those who are spiritually closest to you. So, abna'ana means our closest and best children. Nisa'ana, the closest women to us. And anfusana, which means ourselves. It refers to those who were spiritually closest to Rasulullah. Now, Rasulullah took, as is well established, he took his two children, two grandchildren, Imam al Hassan and Imam al Hussein. That satisfies the section about Abna'ana, which tells you Imam al Hassan is who? Ibn Rasulullah, the son, the heir, the successor of Rasulullah and Imam al Hussein. As for Nisa'ana, Rasulullah could have brought all of his wives, he could have brought the favorite wives. I mean, don't you say that such and such was the favorite wife of Rasulullah, which is a blatant contradiction to the verse in the Quran, which speaks about adala. Doesn't Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say, فَإِنْ خِفْتُمْ أَلَّا تَعْدِلُوا فَوَاحِدًا You should establish justice between your wives if you're married to more than one. And yet, they claim that Rasulullah went around saying, you're my favorite, you're my favorite, you're my favorite, over and over again. In the presence of all of the other wives. I mean, who in their right mind can believe something like this. But regardless, apparently their Prophet doesn't follow his own Quran. The Prophet could have taken the so-called favorite wife. He could have taken Um Salama. He could have taken one of his aunts. Rasulullah had aunts. Safiya was his aunt. He could have taken her. He could have taken any number of women. And yet, of all the women in the entire world, and in the family of Rasulullah, he took who? Fatima. In other words, Allahumma salli In other words, it is incredibly telling given who Rasulullah took and perhaps even more important, who he did not take with him. In other words, Rasulullah is taking the one who is closest to him. The one who is most loved by him. The one who represents him the most. The one who reflects him the most. Hassan, Hussein, Fatima, as for Anfusana. The Prophet is going to take someone who is spiritually closest to him. He is someone that perhaps in this language we could describe as being the fruit of his eye. The one without whom Rasulullah could not survive. His brother, his cousin, his son-in-law, his successor. No, 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 no. Himself. Himself. Once Imam Zayn al-Abideen alayhi salam, you all know, Imam al-Sajjad was living in extreme taqiyya. Extreme taqiyya. Even though Imam al Hussein fought against Yazid ibn Muawiyah, Imam Zayn al Abidin lived under the reign of Yazid ibn Muawiyah for three years. So the taqiyya, the dissimulation, the pressure that was exerted on Imam al Sajjad السلام, was incredibly high. So a few people gathered around him, they said to him that people are saying that the first gypsy is the best Muslim, the second gypsy, this guy, that guy, they started mentioning names, right? Imam Zayn al-Abidin listened, then at the very end, even though he's maintaining taqiyya, remember, the Imam said, okay, fair enough. My words, not his. He said, fair enough. What are they going to do about Ayat al-Mubahal? How will they reconcile saying that A, B, C is the best person and the closest to Rasulullah, and yet Ayat al-Mubahal, which describes Ali ibn Abi Talib as the nafs of Rasulullah, how do you reconcile these two things? How can you whitewash this? How can you omit this? How can you practice historical revisionism on this? And so, Rasulullah picks these individuals. Why? 
Why does the Holy Prophet need these people to go in this showdown between him and the Christians of Najran to invoke the wrath of Allah? There's a couple of explanations for this. The first is that when you're going to challenge someone and invoke God's wrath, you should be prepared to pay a heavy and hefty price, right? In other words, Rasulullah is taking the closest people to him, saying that if God sends down his chastisement and wrath upon me and these loved ones in my family, I'm happy to do it. That's how confident I am in my challenge. That's number one. The other point to mention here is that when you're challenging a liar, okay, which was clearly the case in the story of Mubahala, the other side, who are liars, who obviously expect to have divine retribution sent upon them, they will resort to every dirty tactic, including magic, sorcery. They will use everything they have because they know they don't have divine backing. So what are they gonna do? How will they get out of this? They will use every trick in the book, which means that harm could reach the family of Rasulullah. Potentially, Imam al-Hassan, Imam al Hussein, Fatima, Ali, could be the targets of black magic. And yet, Rasulullah risks all of that. He takes them along with him. The third reason they're there is to say Ameen after the dua of Rasulullah. I want you to think about this for a moment. In other words, Rasulullah, whose prayers are answered, whose invocations Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala responds to, he still needs the Ameen of Hassan, the seven-year-old, for this dua to be answered. Allah. This also tells you that Imam al Hassan knew exactly what was happening. Imam al Hassan's Ameen wasn't just an automatic reply. When we say, Allahumma ajjil li waliyyik al faraj, I might say Ameen. But I don't quite understand it. A child might say Ameen. No, 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 no. Just like the incident of It'am, wa yut'amoon ala hubbihi, miskeena wa yateema wa asira. When Imam al Hassan and Imam al Hussein gave their loaves of bread, they did so voluntarily. It means that they agreed to give the food over to the poor. It's not that Imam Amir al Mu'mineen took their food away from them. In fact, religiously, that's not allowed. This is part of their ma'una. Even a father doesn't have the authority to take their food away from them without them consenting to it. Imam al Hassan and Imam al Hussein fully understood and participated wholeheartedly in the process. And so, the same way in Mubahala, where Imam al Hassan's Ameen and Imam al Hussein's Ameen was absolutely pivotal to the success of the mission of Rasulullah. What do you say to that? This is who Imam al Hassan was. I will conclude with this. You see all of these lights. You see this jubilation, this festivity, this happiness. I wish that just a, a little bit of these lights were now lit on the lonely grave of Imam al Hassan in Baqiya. They've left it in ruins, a dark and desolate. Ruins that's turned into a military fortress. SubhanAllah. This is how this nation repays Rasulullah. This is how this nation treats the son of the Holy Prophet. Once in the Battle of Jamal, Muhammad ibn al-Hanafiya, I think our brother mentioned this in the introduction. Muhammad ibn al-Hanafiya was given the flag to go and launch against the enemy. So he went and fought valiantly with incredible courage, reminiscent of someone who has the genes of Ali ibn Abi Talib. 
So much so that some of the companions of the Imam came to him and they said to him, Ya Amir al-Mu'mineen, Muhammad, your son, fought in such a courageous manner that had it not been for Hassan and Hussein, we would have said he's the greatest warrior. Amir al-Mu'mineen said, how dare you compare my son Muhammad to his brothers. أَيْنَ النُّجُومُ مِنَ الشَّمْسِ وَالْقَمَرُ وَأَيْنَ ابْنِي مِنْ ابْنَي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ Do you compare the tiny stars in the heaven? They have very dim, flickering lights. You compare those with the sun and the moon? How dare you compare my son to the sons of Rasulullah? May Allah illuminate our hearts with love and admiration towards Imam al Hassan al Mushtaba. May we be guided towards knowing Imam al Hassan better than we do. I encourage the young brothers and sisters to read about Imam al Hassan alayhi salam. Watching a lecture is one thing, but that's the least you can do. That's not exactly something that nourishes your thirst for knowledge. It doesn't give you the meat, if you like. Read about Imam al Hassan. Educate yourself. In fact, use these occasions not just to attend the majlis and seek blessings from these wonderful and beautiful gatherings, but also to increase your knowledge about him, inshallah.